What is it about the eerie desolation of New Mexico's wilderness? Is it the unknown secrets that lay buried beneath the earth? Or perhaps it's the things that come out at night. The same things that come from the farthest reaches of our nightmares. Tonight, I'll be telling you harrowing tales sent in to me from an eyewitness who encountered a large unknown predator that nearly made him its next meal. Today's story was sent in by Billy. Billy has always had a bit of an interest in the unusual. Also, like many people, he believes that sometimes, if you want something to be true, your mind tends to believe it is true. Regardless, he is much more of a believer now in the supernatural than when he was growing up. Growing up, he always thought there was something more than life as we know and understand it, but wasn't really sure what that was. He has now had three encounters in his life that he cannot explain, not for lack of trying. At best, two of these encounters were a little spooky and mysterious. One, however, was a sheer, absolute nightmare-inducing terror. We'll save the best one for the last. Now, about 20 years ago, Billy was fresh out of high school and wondering what the heck to do with his life. While he was always in above-level classes in high school, for some reason, he just couldn't wrap his head around college at the time. Billy and his close circle of friends were all pretty much in the same boat. One day, they decided they were tired of just sitting around till the wee hours of the morning playing Halo 2 and drinking Mountain Dew. Someone brought up the idea of going to see some haunted locations around the Houston area, where they all lived at the time. They probably went on over a dozen excursions to various places, old sanitariums, slave cemeteries in the middle of the dark woods, and even a couple of places that were reportedly old native burial grounds. Of all these adventures, two yielded encounters that he couldn't immediately explain. The first time was at an old abandoned house. This story would have taken place at least 50 years prior to the internet so it's difficult to know many details. However, this is how the story was conveyed to the group. A man and his family had about five acres in an up and coming suburb outside of Houston. This property was a decent distance outside of town. The man and his wife had a nice little one story house and had began to try to develop their property into a subdivision. Suddenly and unexpectedly, his wife became very ill and ended up passing away. This absolutely devastated and broke the husband. So the night after his wife's passing, he woke up his eight kids one by one, took them out to the pool and drowned them before ending his own life. Billy says that he has tried to look up the story recently but doesn't know where to start and hasn't been able to find much. Here's the story of what happened when they went to this location. The property was surrounded by a chain link fence and secured with a lock. Being a group of late teens and young 20-somethings, they decided to break the lock and go check it out. The house was kind of in the center of the property towards the front, maybe about 200 yards from the fence line. As they made it about 100 yards toward the house, they noticed a faint glowing orange light on the other side of the property from where they had entered it. It looked to them like a lit cigarette. They quickly did a head count to ensure no group members had run ahead as most of them smoked at the time. They were all still together and everybody was accounted for. Then, as they turned their attention back towards the light, it began moving. It looked as if someone had lit a cigarette in their hand and they were walking, swaying their arms back and forth in a natural motion as they walked toward the group. Being young and naturally still thinking they were invincible, about half of them started walking faster towards the light. They were maybe about 20 yards from intersecting the path where the light was headed when it suddenly vanished. They quickly made their way over to the last position where they had seen the light, and when they got there, they could easily see the rim of a pool that had since been slowly filled in with the earth. They all started trying to theorize about what the light could have been. Billy had borrowed his dad's camcorder, so they were able to get it on film. The best explanation that they could come up with was that it was maybe a firefly. But 
Billy has spent plenty of time in the country growing up and knew what fireflies looked like and acted like. He also knew that they didn't move in the type of pattern he had seen last night, and they most certainly didn't stay lit for the 100 yards or so the way they had seen this light move. Not to mention that the light also happened to stop right at the pool where the man had supposedly drowned his own children. They continued to explore the house. Once they got in, they could clearly see that people had been using it to party, hang out, or whatever. There were lots of tags and graffiti on the wall, and they began poking around with the flashlight and came to one room at the back of the house. At this time, it was early fall, maybe September or October-ish, and fall is still relatively warm, at least in the early part of the season and in this part of the state. It wasn't oppressively hot, but it was by no means cold. They had explored every room in the one-story house, except one. When they entered the last room, they immediately noticed that the temperature seemed to drop at least 20 or 30 degrees. That's pretty significant. They all noticed this at the same time, and without prompting, all mentioned how cold this room was in unison. And that's when they noticed a very much tattered and dirty looking stuffed animal in the back corner of the room. They concluded that this must have been a room for at least some of the children. They all thought that this was a bit crazy and turned around and left the room. The cold sensation immediately stopped as soon as they walked back out of the room. At this point, the only thing they had left to explore was the basement. Having a basement in and of itself was very strange for these houses in this area. The stairway was only large enough for a few of them to get out on at a time. So Billy and two others went down first. It became immediately apparent that the basement held about two or three feet of water. They stopped about halfway down the stairs and began looking to see what could be seen with their flashlights all while Billy was recording. That's when they all stopped, looked at each other in horror, and the three of them who were on the stairs could all hear what sounded like someone wading through the water. They didn't sound like something on four legs or something that was swimming. It sounded like someone walking slowly through the water. They bolted back up the stairs, rounded everyone up very quickly, and got the heck out of there. And after these adventures, the group would generally meet up at a friend's apartment, hooking up the camera to his TV, watching the tape. They had captured the light anomaly on the camera and once again began to theorize. Unfortunately, the camera hadn't picked anything up in the cold room. When they went down the stairs to the basement, they could clearly see on the tape that when they had first stopped and started looking with their flashlights, the water in the basement was completely flat and undisturbed. However, once they started hearing a sloshing sound, which they hadn't noticed when they were down there, the camera caught waves coming from the back corner. They knew that the waves were something they couldn't have gotten just with a flashlight because of how they were positioned on the stairs. And that freaked them out even more and left them with more to wonder about. The only other time something mysterious happened while they were out on an adventure can also be tied back to another tragic story. This incident occurred about an hour outside of Houston in a little lakeside community called Dayton Lake Estates. Here, a couple was building a lovely little three-story lake house to live in. The house was probably about 90% complete and the couple could not wait any longer and decided to move in. Not long after moving in, the wife returned home early one day to find her husband in their third story master bedroom in bed with the neighbor's wife. So she grabs a gun, takes care of business, bam, goes her husband, bam, goes the other wife, bam, takes herself out, done. When they got to this house, they first noticed that it matched the story that they had heard very well. It did appear to be almost finished, but not entirely. It looked like after the crime scene had been cleared, no one got around to finishing the house and it had fallen into disrepair. Billy and his friends noted that every one of the windows they saw had been completely shattered and broken out. Once they entered the house, it became pretty clear that the house was likely being used as a party house by some teens or possibly young adults. Besides that, everything appeared to be pretty much how they left it on that fateful day. 
There was an old hoop-style oversized wicker chair in one corner. There was a console table with an old-style calculator that was probably the size of a typewriter on it and a few dishes still in the cabinets. They even found a dirty clothes hamper that appeared to match the style that had been popular when the event was rumored to have occurred. As they made their way up the central staircase, they began exploring the rooms as best they could. They had to be careful to avoid falling through the numerous holes and obvious weak areas. The third floor had only three rooms. One appeared to be the master bedroom where that gruesome set of events took place, and Billy was once again the cameraman. He and three or four others from the group were the first ones into the master bedroom. It was almost the same feeling as before. It was noticeably colder in that room, and in addition to this room being cold, it was also difficult to breathe. Who knows? The group may have simply walked into a room full of asbestos. Whatever the case, each of them agreed that it was difficult to breathe. And the first thing they noticed in the room was something on the far wall opposite where the bed would have likely been. There, they saw a circular rose window that still had every single decorative pane of glass on it. It stood out because it was the window in the house, the only window in the house without broken glass. Even the window just below it was broken. It seemed eerie. At this point, it was right around midnight. And that night, there wasn't much of a moon out, and it was overcast, so it was pretty dark. That's when they noticed that the window was glowing. It was faint, but definitely noticeable. They tried to explain it away as moonlight or maybe a reflection of light coming from one of the other residences nearby, but the only problem with this theory is that the only light they could see on the house was about 150 yards away through a thick canopy of trees. With what was essentially zero moonlight, they also pretty quickly ruled that out as the source of the light. Not only that, but the moon was actually to their backs at this point. The light that seemingly emanated from this window pointed very clearly to the scene of the crime where the bed would have been. At this point, everyone was clamoring to see this discovery and people began filtering in and out of the room, all reported similar cold and breathing instances. Billy was filming the entire time. At one point, they even sent someone outside with a bright flashlight to shoot up the window. They couldn't replicate the beam of light. Billy was the last one out of that room. About 30 seconds after the last person left, he shuts off the camera and they got back in their cars and left. The young men agreed that what they had experienced was interesting, but not necessarily terrifying, at least so far. As usual, they immediately watched the tape upon returning to the apartment. They had documented everything. However, when it came to the master bedroom, the light that had seemingly emanated from that window was barely captured. It looked nothing like it had when the group was actually standing there. However, it wasn't until the end of the tape that they found an alarming discovery. In those last 30 seconds of the tape, you can hear Billy's friend, who was the last person in the room with Billy, saying, Okay man, I'm gonna go get out of here. The friends leave and begins walking down the stairs. Again, Billy was now alone in this room. Now about four or five seconds after the last person leaves and he is alone, a small fuzzy green ball of light appears on the tape. Billy was very used to this camcorder and didn't think he had done anything to cause this. In fact, he was against the opposite wall trying to capture the strange lights emanating from the rose windows. Suddenly, the fuzzy green dot starts moving about the room on the tape. Billy was very confused by this as he generally made it a habit while filming to move the camera aside and periodically peek around the lens to ensure he wasn't missing anything. He never saw this green fuzzy light floating around and no one was in the room with him at the time. Remember, this is before cell phones were a big thing, so people didn't carry around things that could potentially create such an image. Billy noted that it also seemed to float around the room in an ethereal way. That combined with the fact that this house was really old and their footsteps would have easily detected anyone entering the room on creaking floorboards. That was another head scratcher that left them all wondering. The group went out a few more times after this incident, but 
Ultimately, each member went their own way, which was the end of these group adventures. Now, those were just the teaser stories. The really, truly terrifying thing happened to Billy about three years prior. His family was pretty active in Boy Scouts, and they made it a yearly trip every summer to go up to Philmont Scout Ranch. This is an awesome and absolutely beautiful area outside Cimarron, New Mexico. It sits right at the start of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Appropriately, a little bit ominous. There is typically about a two-year waiting list to be able to do a 14-day trek to the mountains there. But Billy was lucky because his dad would sometimes run training classes up there, so he got to go on shorter 10-day tracks to the mountains every single summer. This encounter takes place on their third or fourth year of visiting. The scenery is impressive, and backpacking through the area is truly a wonderful experience. They had left a manned camp the day prior and would now be spending the night at a primitive campsite. The ranch is set up so that the western and central areas are all marked with trails with a mix of manned and primitive camps all along them. However, the eastern area of the ranch is entirely without trails. There are no roads and virtually no people. Only the rangers themselves and a few experienced and selective older scouts are allowed to even trek through the area. Even at that, not many ever do as it can be inherently dangerous even for seasoned backpackers and with it being such a large area, it is easy to run into danger. Billy and the group were on day 7 of their trek. Two days prior, they had made it as far north as they would go and had begun the journey back to base camp. They were pretty far east in the central part of the map. They had just come down off a mountain and were on the easternmost trail. The camp they stayed at was in the saddle between two mountains and had a breathtaking view. Looking back to the west, the direction they had just traveled was an equally incredible view of the wilderness area. They set up camp with no issues, had dinner, and turned in early for the night. Not long after, they had all retired to their tents and one of Billy's friends in the tent beside him began vomiting. It was late and they were all exhausted. The two adults with them were already asleep, as was most of the crew. It was just the four of them in two adjacent tents that had noticed. They all decided that because it was late and they were incredibly tired, even though it's proper procedure to walk to the bear bag to dispose of it, they really didn't feel like hiking all that way. They ended up just tossing the bag about 20 feet from the tents next to a tree. They all went back to bed because, like usual, they were all planning to wake up before dawn the next day to hit the trail early. Now, a little after 2 in the morning, Billy woke up to use the restroom. As soon as he unzipped the tent, his nose was assaulted with an absolutely horrible odor. It smelled like death and bile mixed with sweaty gym socks. At first, he didn't think too much of it because he knew that the vomit bag was not too far away. Also, this group of campers had not been able to shower in a while. He continued to climb out of his tent groggily. This would be the second time Billy went against their procedures this evening. He was feeling lazy and absolutely exhausted. He should have walked away from the camp to relieve himself. Instead, he took a few short steps to be out of view. Now, Before he could take another, he noticed that directly in front of him, about 20 feet away, was a big black mass. He instantly froze, his gaze now fixed on this object. Part of their initial orientation, and before they can begin any hike, is to go over bear safety. The scouts are all taught the do's and don'ts of the trail regarding bears and how to avoid encounters with them. This also includes what to do if you are close to a black bear at night. After all, it wasn't unheard of for hikers to come across a black bear wandering through their camp in the middle of the night. Scouts are taught to get loud and get big, and at this point, Billy was basically screaming like a banshee and making as much noise as possible to scare it away. He felt lucky that he didn't panic and that his training instantly kicked in. He reacted quickly and inhaled deeply to begin screaming. Then. He froze in sheer terror. 
As soon as he inhaled deeply, the black mass seemed to take notice. The mass quickly turned its head toward Billy, and Billy's gaze was met with the deepest, piercing yellow eyes he had ever seen. The moon was barely a thumbnail that night and was still pretty low on the horizon. Never mind that it was blocked by the numerous trees surrounding the camp. It was pretty dark. There was just enough light to make things out, and that was about it for it not to be completely black. The yellow eyes seemed to glow, and Billy knew eye shine and this wasn't eye shine. Instantly, as its gaze fixed directly on Billy, he got goosebumps, his hair stood on end, and as he stood motionless, transfixed by the glowing set of eyes that were now locked on him, the creature began slowly standing up on its back legs. Billy couldn't move, he couldn't look away. He immediately noticed that this being was taller than him, maybe seven feet tall, perhaps a little more. He also immediately realized that this did not look like a bear. He had seen plenty of black bears in real life and had actually had several encounters with them before, though none had been as close as this outside of the zoo. Regardless, he was pretty familiar with what a black bear looked like. This mass stood fully erect and seemed incredibly muscular. It didn't have the same awkward kind of slumped posture that a black bear typically has when standing on its hind legs. Of course, this all terrified Billy. They stood for what seemed like an eternity, their eyes locking on each other's. In reality, it was probably less than 30 seconds. It felt like hours. Then the mass began to raise its arms from its body towards Billy, and this was the same time Billy noticed the claws. They were easily three inches long and looked utterly terrifying. But the worst part is, is that they appeared to be coming from what Billy described as human-like hands. Even today, just thinking about this gives Billy the chills. As he stood there, he's transfixed on this being. It was now looking incredibly menacing and definitely not a bear. But Billy could hear it breathing. It made the sound of a deep guttural growl, not very loud, but more than enough for Billy to know that this thing did not have good intentions. His mind was now in overdrive, picturing all the horrible things that this thing could do to him. Then it took a step towards him, Billy's mind now racing, and an absolutely paralyzing panic instantly washed over his body. Billy was convinced he was going to die right here, right now. Billy had not noticed, but during this time, a fellow camper about three tents over from his tent had also opened their tent and was emerging. Their tents were arranged in a loose, spread out semicircle. The position of the fellow camper's tent would have given him the profile view of this creature. Billy was still in his terror-induced trance and fixated upon this creature. Billy's fellow camper that had emerged remembered his bear training and began jumping around and screaming and waving his arms around. The creature paused mid-step and began the most menacing snarl either of them had ever seen. Its razor-sharp teeth started to show, and this sent Billy's level of fear to an absolutely soul-wrenching level that he did not know was possible. The only slight relief was that the creature had begun to turn away from Billy and towards this newfound commotion. Luckily, the rest of his fellow campers instantly knew what was going on and all came flying out of their tents as well. And they began to join in the cacophony of noise, all screaming and yelling, making as much noise as possible, waving their arms, creating much chaos. The last person to emerge from their tent was one of the adults who had brought an air horn for just such an occasion. The next thing Billy remembers is the deafening blast of the air horn and the creature suddenly confronted with the rest of the crew and the accompanying outburst of activity let out a vocalization that he will never forget. The best way he can describe it was like a cross between a lion's roar, a wolf howl, and somehow like a person screaming at the same time. The creature then turned away from the camp and began sprinting away. At first on two legs, and then after about 20 or 30 yards, it drops down on all fours. The rest of the crew continues making noise for a little bit, 
until they all saw that it disappeared into the woods. Everybody was checking on each other, making sure everybody was okay. Billy was still pretty much dumbfounded from the encounter. Then, slowly, they began to check their camp. They looked at the stump where they had cleaned their dishes from dinner, checked the bear bag, and deposited the bag of vomit in it. They saw that nothing had been disturbed, so after a few minutes of the crew excitedly discussing the situation, everybody returned to their tents to try and grab a couple more hours of sleep. Billy would certainly not be able to get back to sleep that night. He and his tent mate just kind of laid there, and after probably about 30 minutes or so of staring at the top of the tent, Billy's tent mate rolled over, still trying to be quiet and whispered, that wasn't a bear, was it? Billy just looked at him and said no, and they laid there in silence for the rest of the night. After they got up the following day, they ate breakfast, broke camp as usual, and they were just starting to load up their packs as the sun began to slowly peek over and ascend above the mountain range to the east. Everybody was going about their business, but also continuing to look around for any evidence of what transpired the night before. One of the other hikers said, Wow, look at this! What they saw was a rather intimidating looking print. It wasn't even that big, it was probably about average person size. What made it frightening was how clearly you could see the giant claw marks at the end of its feet. As if Billy needed any further convincing that this was not a bear, this footprint looked nothing like a bear print. At the time, Billy noticed that the direction of the print and path that he remembers the creature taking was directly east towards the wilderness area. The following two days of the hike were relatively uneventful, while the rest of the crew occasionally reveled in the crazy events that took place that night. Billy's tent mate and him never joined in or talked about it again. On their last morning, they actually hit the trail before sunrise and were only roughly seven miles away from the base camp. They were hiking down a little dirt road and maybe only had about five miles left when a camp truck passed by them and began blowing on its horn. They all turned around to see a mountain lion scamper off the path and into the woods. It had evidently been stalking the group for who knows how long. After what had happened the night before, that information didn't really phase Billy. He just kept thinking to himself that there were many worse things out there than mountain lions. They returned to base camp and boarded the bus for the two-day ride home. The encounter with the creature in their camp was all Billy could think about. He just kept going over it in his head again and again. They followed procedures regarding where they ate and how everything was set up. Also, the bear bag was a good 200 yards away in another direction. All of those areas have been entirely undisturbed. Any hungry animal would have easily gone to one of those three areas first to look for a meal. Billy quickly came to the terrifying conclusion that that creature, whatever it was, was there for them. Billy says that if he lives to be 100 years old, he will never forget those piercing yellow eyes and the unearthly roar he heard that night. But more importantly, what do you guys think? Is Billy's case of stories all full of crap? Did he make all this up? Are these fictitious tales or are these truly harrowing nightmare real life experiences? I'll let you decide. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that big old red subscribe button and like button if you enjoyed today's content. But more importantly, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll catch you all in the very next video.